Einstein. So I'm delighted to see uh, people still here in the room. I think it has been a busy day for all of us. We had uh, heard a lot of different uh, talks and um, I'm delighted that there are still uh, people here. So my name is uh, Janine de Zeeuw um, and on behalf of the uh, ECMI, uh, I open this uh, final session uh, for today. Um, and in here we have uh, four different uh, experts. They will uh, give a give a presentation on their um, help project and thereafter there will be uh, a Q&A uh, session. Um, but please, the floor is yours, um, Sabine. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, yeah, we have the slides, perfect. So I'm gonna start on behalf of the HELP Consortium and uh, I think in the room we can also see we're in a neglected space. <laughs> And we're trying to hold up our flags for anti-helminthic drug development. And I want to just introduce you a little bit why we're doing what we do. And if you go on to the next slide. Or the acoustic is schlecht. There we go. Okay. And we... <coughs> We um, heard already a lot about NTDs today, but I just want to reiterate one point. Not that it's not clear to the people in this room, but if you put all the um, helminth infections together, they are not deadly um, as other diseases. However, if you combine them, they are massive um, or responsible for a massive amount of DALIs. So they are an important part of the, um, the global health system and the global health problems. For all of these diseases, which covers not only one infectious species, but several ones, we have only a few drugs that are actually used. And the ones in green are the ones highlighted um, that are given in a mass drug administration program. What I want to say with that is, first of all, for the population, there's in most of the cases no drug available if you suffer from symptoms, so you cannot go to the healthcare system or the, uh, to the healthcare center and acquire a drug. You need to wait for your mass drug administration. Um, however, uh, having that said, with this mass drug administration, of course, it was a very, very useful tool to reduce the burden of morbidity. So the prevalence and the disease intensity really has reduced. However, now that we are at the stage of moving from elimination of the disease as a global health problem to the elimination of diseases um, overall, we do need more specific tools. And with those few drugs that we have, we know that they are not targeting all the life cycle stages. stages. So they, we, we need more optimized tools. And now is the time to really move into the more patient-oriented direction to think about this. And um, at the end of the day, and we have had this discussion in several other sessions as well, we need in the future an MDA independent system because MDA means dependency on the country, uh, on the donation, and it is a huge effort um, uh, financially that we don't know if we can sustain for um, a longer time. So we need more sustainable alternative systems. And drug development and bringing new drugs forward like pediatric prosequantil, like moxidectin, will help us in the future to also create a more sustainable health system. So um, when we talk about drug uh, development, this is an optimal drug development um, uh, scheme. So you start with something like five to 10,000 compounds. You have attrition rates because not all of them out of a series are active. You will lose compounds, then they go into the preclinical space. You lose compounds due to toxicity. And then out of these 10,000 compounds, only five arrive in the, in the clinical stage. Then you have phase one, which is uh, the part in healthy volunteers, and then phase two and three for proof of concept. Again, you further um, lose your compounds. And then at the end of the day, you end up with one drug. If you have, um, uh, normally this process in the, the uh, pharma environment is about um, $1 billion. We are trying to, because we cannot come up for NTDs with these amount of money to do a proper drug development, we need to find alternative ways. One way is to repurpose drug, for example, from the veterinary um, uh, pipeline. And um, this is a little bit what we are trying to, um, to convey in here, that this repurposing method is a good way to go. And that goes back to the core principle of the One Health concept, 
which is between animal and human medicines, there are no dividing lines, nor should there be. The object is different, but the experience obtained constitutes the basis of all of medicine. And um, this um, helps us to rely on an existing veterinary package um, that will help us to kind of jumpstart a little bit the process of, of drug development. That's number one. Number two is it will also help us to uh, rely already on a proof of concept um, uh, 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 data set that shows us that a drug is active on a parasite in, um, in animals. So the chances to be also active on a very related parasite in humans are increasing. And the third point, and this is very important, and why we have together uh, set up the HELP Consortium, is really to look at drugs that maybe go across one disease and um, uh, leverage a little bit the effort that is done for one disease to other diseases as well. So we are looking and trying to identify um, molecules that can maybe act across the different diseases, meaning onchocerciasis, loiasis, salt transmitted helminths, and also LF. And um, this hopefully will help us a little bit to reduce the burden and make a um, and, and to reduce the cost, basically, um, to move forward with new drugs. It also has another, um, another advantage, is really to liaise with uh, pharma industry. And as we heard in other sessions, we cannot do that all by ourselves. We need in-kind contributions um, to enable the drug development. And um, here's a very simple chart of what we have in onchocerciasis or in the filarial uh, R&D pipeline. I can already expand that this is almost the, the nematicidal uh, pipeline, basically, because for soil transmitted, for example, we don't have a lot. And this is actually the only compounds that are uh, in the translational space. One point is that we have no drug discovery. This is very important to note, and it's very important to keep up the drug discovery. And um, the second point is that all these drugs are not front runners and backups. They all have their different use case. So this is also different from a normal um, pipeline. And I just will focus on the molecules that we are um, dealing with in, um, in the HELP consortium. So we are looking at um, a few uh, preclinical compounds, one being coralopyronin and um, uh, uh, oxfendazole. And Mark will talk a little bit about the preclinical stage. And then I'm very, very glad to, to have Dr. Jonko here with us because he will actually um, talk about how we move one compound from the preclinical space to the clinical space. And he will present on a phase one trial that was done in Tanzania, um, which is for two reasons very important. One, in sub-Saharan Africa, and second, for the molecule itself. And then we will have um, Jennifer, who will talk about uh, the specific drugs for soil transmitted helminths, uh, one being imodepside and also um, uh, oxantil. And um, with that, um, I'll always come to the end. I just want to look, before we go into what help constitutes, a little bit into the future. So one of these candidates, um, the oxfendazole one, is a very promising one, and with a successful phase one, we are ready to go into um, infected patients. And um, the standard drug development is one drug at a time, one disease at a time, and we are trying to take a next step and, and try to learn also from COVID. And modern trial designs are now much easier to bring them through. And we have chronic diseases, so we cannot easily exchange compounds and uh, test and treat. We have no biomarkers to have an early endpoint of a clinical trial. These are chronic diseases that need years to develop and also need years for uh, um, uh, following up uh, any effective treatment. So what we are trying to do is fuse basically several diseases and try oxfendazole on all of these diseases at the same time with a, um, a, a consortium that has been built up on help and um, has now also additional members. And what is um, this trial um, about? It's a so-called basket trial, so several diseases, one compound. And uh, that follows the adaptive trial design. Um, so this is under a master protocol. And what are the advantages? On the one hand, because we have several diseases, we can leverage on people who are infected with more than one disease. And this is a phenotype that we see or a situation that we see in sub-Saharan Africa very often. 
And um, that means that the, the patient needs to be screened once, can be allocated according to his infections um, into any of these arms or any of the disease arms. We um, force ourselves to really come together and um, look at different diseases at the same time that will overall reduce the timelines of development because we know very quickly on which disease does the compound work or not. And um, last but not least, we will also force ourselves to harmonize our procedures across the diseases and work together in this collaborative um, um, environment. And we can also use um, uh, resources and structures for all of these diseases together. And we hope that with that, um, we, will, um, we will be hopefully at least in one disease um, effective. And um, I will just spend um, two more minutes on the trial design so that you have an idea. So as I said, we can now include according to the infection that the patient has. We will start on the left-hand side with um, a small safety group because we are going into the vulnerable population. And then we start two doses uh, versus placebo um, to be tested in the diseases. And then um, we recruit 75% into each arm. And then at half of the observation time point at month six, we will reanalyze the data that we have until now. If we see a trend, we are good to continue and full, um, fulfill all the arms of the, of the design. If we are not um, successful, we can actually move and add another arm, which would be a more strong uh, treatment. In this case, it would be twice um, the highest dosing that we propose. So you have adaptations on the one hand on treatment arms. The second thing that you're looking at, you're trying to adapt also in sample size. If you see already a trend and um, you can reanalyze and see, okay, I now need, let's say 30 patients more and then I have um, a reach significance. So all of these adaptations will be done and then we have the final uh, follow-up. And um, having that said, so we hope that with this design we can really tackle several issues. One is reducing the timelines, reducing the cost, and together with what we are doing in help, we think repurposing um, is a way to reduce the costs and attrition rates. We can maintain, and this is what we are trying to do here, a minimal amount of pipeline for neglected diseases and for Hellman's diseases in particular. And with eWorm, we are trying to really um, re refine the, and modernize the trial design um, in the Hellman space. And with that, I will stop here. And here you can see all our partners of HELP and the partners joining us for eWorm. And uh, I hand over to Mark. Okay, good afternoon everyone. So I will talk now about the preclinical work that is done to identify new drug candidates and that introduce the drug candidates that we have now. And just to give you the background, so I will just highlight quickly the two diseases that are of importance for us. So we are identifying the drug candidates mainly for onchocerciasis. Onchocerciasis is a disease that is most prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa. And the issue that we have right now is that the drugs that are used for the mass drug administration do not kill the adult worms. So there's one drug that can kill the adult worms, it's doxycycline. It depletes the Wolbachia endosymbionts of Onchocerca volvulus and thereby also slowly kills the adult worms. However, the issue is it cannot be given to pregnant women, it cannot be given to children below the age of eight, and it has to be given for yeah, five to six weeks on a daily basis. And um, the other disease I would like to talk about is Loa Loa or Loasis, because um, Loa Loa in um, in patients that are infected with lower lower, they can um, develop really high microfilarial loads. And if those patients are now treated with e either ivermectin or DEC, the killing of the microfilaria can lead to life-threatening adverse events. And therefore, co-endemic areas where lower is lo loasis is present is a problem for the elimination of filarial diseases like onchocerciasis. Furthermore, uh, loasis is not listed as a um, neglected trouble disease yet, which means that there are no 
programs to eliminate it yet. Despite this, loasis comes with several pathologies. So for example, it can lead to angioedema, color bar swelling, and it was also shown to lead to an increased mortality rate. So it's definitely worth to also have now drugs for loasis. And with regard to the preclinic, so more than 15 years ago, already an international hit to lead program were in, was established where well, more than 500,000 candidates were tested in vitro. And this was done in collaboration between academia and industry. And out of the hits that were identified, we have more than 450 candidates tested subsequently in the Lithomosoides sigmodontis rodent model. And as you have heard already from Sabine, so we have now only a handful of candidates that progressed into phase one and phase two clinical trials or are actually being started in phase one and phase two clinical studies. So unfortunately, we are not within this optimal drug pipeline, but we are far um, away from it. And I will introduce you now the three candidates that we have, Corallopyrinin A, which is scheduled for phase one clinical trials in 2026. Just shortly, Emodepside, and Jenny will talk more about it, and Oxfendazol. So in our studies, we use the Lithomosoides sigmodontis rodent model. If you look at the life cycle, it resembles the human filarial nematodes. So here we have as vector a tropical red mite, which transmit, transmits the infective L3 larvae. They migrate to the thoracic cavity of the rodents, mold into adult worms. They mate and release the microfilaria, which are then found in the peripheral blood and can be taken up by the mites again. And we can use the little Mosoides sigmodontis model to identify candidates that act against the Wolbachia, since little Mosoides also contains Wolbachia. And we can also use it to identify direct acting compounds, so which act against the fil filaria themselves. Furthermore, it allows us to um, assess the efficacy against the different life cycle stages, so the infective L3 stage, L4, adult worms, and the microfilaria. We can assess the filarial development and the impact on the microfilaria. And the first candidate I will talk about now is Corallopyrinin A. Corolla Corallopyrinin A is a natural product from Corallococcus corallioides, which is soil, transmit, uh, a soil mixobacteria. And uh, it inhibits bacterial DNA dependent on a polymerase, as, does, uh, as do the rifamycins. However, it acts on the switch, switch region, which blocks then the entrance on the DNA template, and therefore, it's also effective against rifamycin resistant uh, Staph aureus. Furthermore, it was shown to be also effective against many gram negative bacteria, including the um, tall C mutants from E. coli. So, as a primary indication, Corallopyrinin A was um, yeah, developed for the treatment of onchocerciasis, and Cor A acts against the Wolbachia endosymbionts of the filaria. And the depletion of the Wolbachia leads to the blocking of the filarial development, slow killing of the adult worms. And we assessed now the efficacy of Corallopyrinin A in the Lithomosoides sigmodontis gerbil model. In this model, we infect the animals with Lithomosoides by natural exposure. And after 12 weeks, when the animals already developed microfilaria, they are treated for two weeks. And then we waited another six weeks before we performed the necropsies. And I'm not showing you now the um, microfilaria and the deple uh, depletion of the Wolbachia, but all this is achieved with the Corallopyrinin A treatment, but I'm also only showing you now the adult worm counts at the end of the experiment. And as you can see here, the bonus therapy with Corallopyrinin A, if it's given for 14 days, leads to a significant reduction of the adult worm burden. And if you combine the anti-Wolbachia candidate Corallopyrinin A with albendazol, then you can even reduce the treatment um, regimen to seven days, and you still achieve this macrophilocytal efficacy. We um, yeah, also calculated then the human equivalent dose um, according to the FDA, and it is estimated that for the human treatment of, on uh, of the treatment of humans with onchocerciasis, we require four milligrams of Corallopyrinin A per kilogram body weight. 
And since we are investigating corallopurinin A as a drug candidate for onchocerciasis, um, we also wanted to assess its efficacy against an Onchocerca species. So Onchocerca oshengi is a filaria that naturally occurs in cattle, and this one is highly um, rel related to Onchocerca vulgus, the human pathogenic filaria. So in collaboration with Professor Samuel Wanchi from Cameroon, we assessed now the efficacy of Corallopurinin A in this model. So he isolates the nodules from the cattle hide, puts them in media culture, and then the male worms can be isolated and implanted into skid mice. Seven days after the implantation, he treated the animals for 14 days with different doses of Corallopurinin A um, orally, be daily, and one week later, um, the adult worms were counted. And similar to the results that we received in the Littermosoides sigmodontis model, we also observed in the onchocerco Yengi mouse model a significant reduction of the adult worm burden, indicating that core A is macrofilaricidal. So furthermore, core A was already assessed in non-GLP in vivo and in vivo toxicity assays. And I don't want to go through this list now, but just highlight that core A has no relevant safety issues. So um, also seven-day repeated dose red and tox assays were already performed. And just um, based on the NOEL, we observed that, or it is um, predicted that there's a the reporting window of 20x, so it should be really safe to treat humans with um, Corallopurinin A. So Corallopurinin A is not only developed for the treatment of, of onchocerciasis, but it was also investigated for its efficacy against uh, different uh, bacteria, including Neisseria gonorrhea, Chlamydia, and Staphylococcus aureus, and shown to be effective. It was also shown to have the potential to treat biofilm-associated bacteria and osteomyelitis. The GLP tox and safety pharmacology will be performed within HELP, and this will start now in beginning of 2024. An oral formulation is already available that was already tested in the Onchitzeko Yengi model, and the phase one study is now scheduled for 2026. So with that, I come already to the second candidate, which is emodepside. So with emodepside, the phase two clinical trial for onchocerciasis is already ongoing, and Jenny will talk about the trials then on the soil transmitted helminths. And emodepside is a repurposed drug, which means it's known or used in the veterinary fields in several decades already, and it's used as a dewormer for intestinal helminths in cats and dogs. But it was also shown to be to have a high efficacy or broad e efficacy against different filarial species, including also different filarial life cycle stages. So it's active against the adult worms, the infective larvae, and the microfilaria. And this was shown in vitro as well as in vivo. And within help. We had now the opportunity to test um, drug candidates from the BioAnimal Health pipeline. And after Elanco bought BioAnimal Health, we um, collaborated with Elanco Animal Health now and were able to test their candidates. And the goal was to identify candidates that have a pan nematode efficacy and which allow even shorter treatment regimens. And to do this, we tested 100 candidates in vitro first against the adult stage in the microfilary from Littomosoides sigmodontis. And Jenny also tested their efficacy against different soil transmitted helminths first in vitro and then also in vivo. And out of the 20 candidates that we subsequently tested in the rodent models, we identified five candidates that had a really good efficacy, as you can see here. So in the Littomosoides sigmodontis model, a single dose treatment was sufficient to clear the maturity of the adult worms. And similar, a sim single treatment with those candidates led to a really good reduction in the Trichorus morris rodent model. And based on HERC, RED PK, and clearance prediction profiles that were already performed for the, those assays, we selected then the candidate five, which should not be 
um, yeah, so we selected the candidate five, which still required a three-day treatment for lithomosoidus sigmodontis to have a good clearance of the added worms, but a single-dose treatment had also a good clearance uh, in the Tricorus morus model. And this just indicates that we are not at the end yet, so it's really possible to identify better candidates, which even allow shorter treatment regimens, and this is only possible if we collaborate um, with partners from industry, academia, etc. And now coming to the end, so I'm talking about oxfendazole, where as you have heard already from Sabine, the phase two clinical trials are now scheduled for 2024. So similar to Amodexide, oxfendazole is a repurposed drug that comes from the veterinary field, where it's used in several decades already as a dewormer. And in humans, uh, multiple ascending phase one study was already done, and uh, it was shown to be safe. And based on this, the NDAI developed we are funding from USAID now a field applicable formulation. Um, and within help now, with this field applicable oral formulation, a bioavailability study was performed in Tanzania. And we assessed also the efficacy of oxfendazole now against filaria. We did this again with the Lithomosoidus sigmodontis rodent model. So here we used the mouse model. We started to treat the animals after they developed adult worms. And we gave them a five-day B-daily treatment orally. And four weeks after treatment start, we performed the necropsies and counted the adult worms. And as you can see here, we have a dose-dependent clearance of the adult worms. And oxfendazole can induce a sterile cur. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, so um, killing of the microfilaria can lead to severe adverse events in loasis patients, but also in orchidsarchiasis patients. And therefore, we want to have a drug that kills the adult worms, but does not kill the microfilaria. And to assess the microfilaricidal efficacy of oxfendazole, we injected no microfilaria from Lithomosoidus sigmodontis in naive mice and observed their clearance over time. In the black line, you can see now the clearance of the microfilaria in an animal that is untreated. And if those animals were treated now with oxfendazole with a regimen that clears the adult worms, you can see in the red line that the clearance of the microfilaria is comparable to the untreated animals, indicating that oxfendazole has no strong microfilaricidal efficacy. In contrast, if you give ivermectin, a drug that is known to uh, rapidly clear the microfilaria, within one day, the majority of the microfilaria were cleared. And similar to our results, a group in Liverpool by Joe Turner showed also that if you inject lower, lower microfilaria into naive mice and treat them with oxfendazole, so it's the red open bar, you have no significant reduction of the microfilaria in comparison to the vehicle control. So this highlights that oral oxfendazole treatment has no strong direct microfilaricidal efficacy, and we do not expect any microfilaria-induced severe adverse events in onchocerciasis and loasis patients. And we have now a potential microfilaricidal candidate, which is safe also to treat for lo loasis patients. And you have seen this slide already from Sabine. So we have now with oxfendazole a candidate that can be tested within um, e-worm against different filial, um, infections, namely onchocerciasis, loasis, and manzanellosis, as well as against soil transmitted helminths. And this will start then next year. So to sum up, I showed you we have now a few candidates identified which are expected to provide a macrofilaricidal efficacy. Those candidates will allow oral treatments that are definitely shorter, so up to 5 to 14 days. And the candidates have different benefits. So corallopurinin A does not only act against the filaria, but is also active against the aureus, chlamydia, and Neisseria. Emodepside is a pan drug that acts against filaria and soil transmitted helminths. And oxfendazole is the only pan drug that is uh, solely macrofilaricidal and therefore can be also used to treat loasis patients. And with that, I'd like to thank a lot of collaboration partners. I hope I didn't miss anyone. And yeah, 
So now I hand over to Dr. Chango, and yeah, thanks for your <laughs> attention. Thank you. Hello, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ed Jongo. Um, yeah. I'm uh, from Tanzania. I will be presenting to you the clinical trial, phase one clinical trial that uh, we conducted under the HELP platform, basically to assess the uh, pharmacokinetics, safety, and tolerability of oxpendazole tablet formulation. So basically, we, we are trying to to face the, the challenge by, by uh, uh, assessing uh, an effective intervention that would kill adult worms using a short treatment regimen. The work has been conducted recently on oxfendazole, and um, this has helped us to, to understand the dynamics of the product, but also uh, advancing the possibility of a new um, option for treatment of uh, soil transmitted helminths and tissue parasites. The HELP Consortium has built a strong foundation to the North-South collaboration, uh, leveraging the local and global scientific resources in combating the public health challenge posed by the neglected uh, diseases. So the, generally, the, the product is explained by the previous speaker. is a registered product for veterinary use. There is information that is available uh, on the first in human, and uh, pharmacokinetic data have shown its safety in humans at acceptable exposure. Uh, Oxfendazole acts against the adult worms and uh, a promising drug candidate that could be used in lower co-endemic country uh, because uh, it has no effect on the microfilaria. The present study is based on the, what we have learned from the previous studies. Uh, that used the clinical, uh, uh, the liquid formulation for the, for the clinical trials. Uh, the present study, we were assessing a different formulation, the tablet formulation, which has been developed to enable future efficacy studies in infected patients to be conducted in more remote areas and closer to the real life settings. The, the, this, the current study uh, intended to evaluate a suitable formulation to deliver a usable product not only for clinical trials, but ultimately for clinical uh, use in all regions. Uh, this, these are the design considerations. Basically, uh, we have uh, uh, predicted the efficacious human dose range from animal models, and then we assessed uh, doses ranging from 100 milligram as a single dose to 400 milligrams uh, as a single dose, and then again to 400 milligrams multiple doses given over the five days. And these were corresponded to, to a range of, uh, of, uh, of dose per milligram in milligram per kilogram. Uh, basically, we, we targeted to have uh, a, 30, a total number of 30 healthy volunteers. So these were not non-infected volunteers and divided into three cohorts, each with 10 participants. The volunteers aged between 18 to 45 years, uh, males and females. Uh, uh, basically, the study product uh, uh, unit was 100 milligram um, oxfendazole tablet, and that, uh, we also used the placebo tablet that matched the oxfendazole tablet in appearance. The primary objective was to, uh, to investigate the PK uh, or the pharmacokinetic of oxfendazole and its metabolites, fenbendazole and fenbendazole sulfone, after either a single dose or a multi-dose uh, or oral administration for this uh, tablet formulation. Uh, the second objectives included also to investigate the safety and tolerability of the oxfendazole after either single or multiple uh, administration of this uh, tablet formulation. So I think I will uh, start off with uh, um, the study setup. So the study was conducted in Tanzania. Tanzania is located in uh, East Africa um, along Indian Ocean and um, uh, in a place that is called Bagamoyo, which is 
uh, a semi-rural uh, area, basically. We have a clinical trial, a dedicated clinical trial facility, as you can see on the picture. This is intended to, to be able to assess these products, either first-in-man products or the phase 1B uh, products. And it is a full GCP compliant uh, uh, facility with all the quality management systems that are needed in order to ensure the safety of the participants or of the human uh, participants in the clinical trials. The, the facility is equipped with uh, in-house monitoring facilities that are needed for this type of study. Uh, for example, uh, we have performed for this trial a number of uh, PKE assessments, but also cardiac evaluations in order to assess safety, which included the single and triplicate ECG measurements continuously. So we needed to have uh, three to five days of admission within the ward. The, there's also a setup for emergency care in case participants have an emergency uh, and stabilization, but also an ambulance that would help to transfer uh, participants after stabilization if an emergency occurs. The safety and research assay setup, basically the laboratory is close and nearby, so all the PK and safety samples can be analyzed within the time and processed. Uh, uh, in the ward, all the uh, clinical assessments are performed continuously by well-trained nurses and, uh, and medical doctors. So after showing that uh, quick setup of the facility, I would like to just quickly describe the design of the study. The study included three uh, cohorts, as I mentioned. This was a randomized, a double-blind, uh, placebo-controlled trial. And uh, each cohort consisted of 10 participants divided into eight to two, eight who received the active product and two who received the control, placebo control. And uh, the blue line indicates the number of days that participants were maintained in the ward. As we mentioned, the first cohort included a 100 milligram single dose. And uh, after the last participant was assessed uh, with, the, with the safety data and PKE assessment until 48 hours um, post the post dose, then there was a safety review committee which did the, the blinded safety and PK data review in order to approve for the progression into the, the, the higher dose, which is 400 milligrams. And this happened um, uh, around July 2022 and uh, allowed also uh, to go to the multiple doses. Those was given over five days, uh, including the three days of observation within the world. So some of the results, the, these are the disposition of the participants. I think the more interesting, you can look also on the overall um, number of participants that were screened compared to maybe the, the number of participants that were eligible. It's almost 50% uh, or 40% basically. And therefore, this indicates the stringent of the screening criteria that we used for phase one trials that needed healthy participants uh, there were a number of uh, investigations that were needed, which included liver function tests, renal function tests, uh, cardiac evaluations, uh, but also uh, hematological examinations. The, for the, basically also for the demographic characteristics, you can see a number of um, characteristics, but also most importantly is the gender uh, inclusion. We had almost 40 to 60% uh, inclusion, 40% uh, of the female participants, which were, were needed to use highly effective methods, but also the double barrier uh, protection. But I think this is very encouraging that we are, we are having a good um, um, involvement of both genders in the clinical trials as participants, and they also comply to the use of the stringent methods that are needed for pregnancy prevention for the early phase trials. I think also, I think the, the, uh, one of the, our primary objective was to look at the, the plasma pharmacokinetics and following the single dose of either 100 or 400 milligrams, the, the, the table here indicates basically that, uh, and also if you look at the uh, logarithmic figure, that the, the, the 
Concentration was characterized by the slow absorption uh, uh, with median Tmax values that varied basically between uh, 2.53 for the higher dose to uh, 3.06 for the low dose. But there was also a, a, a post um, Cmax plasma concentration which decreased slowly and in a monophasic manner. If you look at the, the, the uh, log log logarithmic figure, the geometric mean uh, apparent uh, half-life appeared to be independent of the dose. And you can see between the, the 100 and 400, uh, it was around 13 for both. For, for the uh, multiple doses of 400 milligrams of exfendazole for five days, basically uh, you have the linear but also the algorithmic uh, figures. The above, the above figure shows the days, uh, in terms of days of administration, uh, the drug was administered for five days. So basically, uh, uh, the, the, the steady state was reached uh, uh, at around day three, and uh, after multiple dosing, the PK of expendazole was characterized by the median Tmax of three hours and uh, uh, T half of... Uh, um, of uh, 11 uh, 11.5 hours, and this is basically similar to, to what was observed after the single dose, uh, high, high dose uh, administration. On the safety perspective, uh, none of the 30 participants that we treated with the study drugs reported clinically significant abnormalities, and uh, there were no abnormal clinical significant laboratory results. Uh, there was no clear trend of increasing or decreasing uh, vital signs parameters over time for any of the of the oxfendazole cohorts, or the plus, or even the pooled placebo groups, and no clear differences between the cohorts of oxfendazole and the pooled placebo groups. There were no abnormal, uh, uh, clinically significant vital signs results over time, and there were no uh, physical examination abnormalities uh, over time. And this is was a very very close observation of the participants continuously in the ward, 24 hours a day for three to five days. The, in conclusion, uh, we, we have seen that the, we can say that the exposure to the investigation of drug was greatest for oxfendazole, followed by the, the byproduct, the fenbendazole, sulfon, and fenbendazole. Uh, also, the geometric mean uh, apparent half-life of oxfendazole was about 13 hours and appeared to be independent of the dose. The inter-participant variability was high, actually, for oxfendazole and moderate for metabolites after single dose uh, administration and decreased after multiple uh, dosing. The, we also uh, want to comment on the teamwork uh, between the sites, the sponsor, and all the stakeholders uh, proved to be a very important asset in accomplishing this, this task. And uh, we, we say that in, uh, programs that are involving South uh, North South collaboration are important to improve chances of uh, success in fight against neglected diseases in uh, affected communities. Last, I would like to acknowledge uh, all the clinical trial participants that participated in this trial, the community of Bagamoyo, the regulatory authorities in Tanzania, and the ethics committees also for supporting us, advising us, and also uh, making sure that we are, we are conducting and adhering to the GCP uh, principles for clinical trials, uh, but also other partners and donors, including the Swiss TPH, the DNDI, uh, uh, Ifakara Health Institute, from where I'm coming from. The picture on the right uh, indicates the team that uh, primarily was involved in conducting uh, this work. Of course, uh, there was a larger team at the community level, community healthcare workers uh, that are not in that picture, but also supported in accomplishing this task. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah. Gotcha. So many thanks, uh, Dr. Jongo. Uh, as you heard uh, in our HELP program, we, we really try to, to break the silos. So on the one side, we really have a, a huge consortium of, of different partners um, consisting of DNDIs, um, represented mainly by Sabine. We have, um, of course, academic partners, and we have industrial partners, as we heard also from, from Mark, which is representative um, by Ilanco. And uh, we work on two main diseases, and uh, 
I will now switch a bit back from the filarial more to, to the, to the salt-transmitted helminths, and uh, I don't really need to introduce them because you have heard throughout the con conference uh, that these are, of course, the two hookworm speci species, the, the roundworm ascaris and the, the whipworm trichoris, and you also heard how enormously high the number of um, affected people is. So, Sabina has already pointed out a bit the, the shortage, um, the lack of, of drugs we have, which was really our, our aim in, in this project. For, for the salt transmitted helminths, we have mainly two drugs we widely use, which are the two benzimidazoles, albendazole and, and mebendazole, which we widely use in so-called preventive chemotherapy program programs to reduce morbidity. And we use these two because um, they can be given uh, in a weight independent dose. And you see all of these drugs um, are, are really old. Um, so I have sh I've shown this slide. Uh, since we have many supporters of us in the audience, you, ha you have probably seen this before. Um, our main concern is, is, is trichuris, um, which when you give them at the doses which are compatible for preventive chemotherapy, have a really low cure rate and also the egg reduction rate, so cure being um, neg egg negative af after treatment and egg reduction rate um, decreased burden um, or egg burden after treatment. So none of these recommended drugs work very well uh, against trichoris and hence uh, our aim um, to basically develop new treatments. So are there alternatives? Um, there are two other um, antihelmintics. Uh, one is, of course, the most widely used ivermectin um, on the essential medicine list. We have heard a lot about it because it's widely used for strong gluitis. It's um, also widely used in filarial program. It has no activity against COVID. Um, and then there is this der der derivative, a uh, similar compound, which is moxidectin, which is around since about five years. But none of these two drugs, when worked, uh, when basically used as monotherapy, they don't work against trichoris either. So what we can do is we can combine them with, with albendazole. And um, this is what, what, what we have done, and we studied in more detail. So, so you see here on this slide uh, results from a multi-country study where we tried to test albendazole, ivermectin versus albendazole. And these are the, the cure rates against trichoris. And you see the combination of albendazole, ivermectin works very well in two of the sites, but it doesn't work um, in, in Cotiva. And um, what is really um, a, a bas basically very um, surprising, but also, um, I would say, frightening is we have recently done a similar trial in Uganda, and we see uh, the same findings as in, in Gotiba, that the combination of albendazole ivermectin also doesn't work um, very well in, in Uganda. Um, there seems to be really f f like a, a quite a differences in the susceptibility, because when we heard about uh, results yesterday from Jose Munoz, um, in his countries, the combination seems to work well, as we see here in Laos and Pemba, but uh, there are also sites um, where, where it doesn't work. We were interested um, also to, to look into this Cotiva situation a, a bit further, and we did an expulsion study followed by um, full um, sequencing of, of the worms. And um, what you see is basically this is the phylogenetic tree. Uh, the, the colored um, triangles on, on, the, on the top um, is, are the worms um, we see, um, or basically we sequence in Gotiva. And you see that they don't cluster with, with the other uh, trichuris worms. The one in pink, is the our worms uh, from Trichoris suis. And you see it's a different clade. So the, the worms from Godiva are, 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 are different from, from Trichoris suis, so they are Trichoris tecuria, um, but they cluster very closely, and it could be that uh, a hybridization has taken place. We don't really know why um, they are not sensitive, and this is something um, 
that we continue to, to find out, and this is uh, work of my PhD student, um, Max Baer. We are also, we're also interested about how does albendazole um, moxidectin performs versus albendazole ivermectin. And um, here we did two studies. Um, the first study was, was done by Vivian Sprecher, who is also in the audience. And if you have further questions about this study, you can ask her later on. But basically, we confirmed that also albendazole moxidectin doesn't work in Godiva. So we had hope that maybe with moxidectin, a more powerful treatment, um, we could overcome uh, the, the low drug sensitivity, but we couldn't. We did a, a, another study um, um, on Pemba, Tanzania, where we compared albendazole moxidectin and albendazole ivermectin in terms of um, non-inferiority with regard to egg reduction rates and as a secondary outcome, looking into the comparison of the combination to, to the monotherapy. And this was work by a former uh, PhD student of mine, um, uh, Sophie Welsche. So what you, you can see, the, the black bar here, so these are the egg reduction rate, the black bar is the albendazole ivermectin, um, which had an, an egg reduction rate of 99%. We set the non-inferiority margin at 2%, which is then the, the red bar. Um, what you also see is that moxidectin is failed to achieve this. Um, it, this combination was on, on the setting on PEMBA was inferior to albendazole ivermectin. So from our results, um, albendazole ivermectin um, is against trichoris, the better um, drug combination. With regard to comparison of the two combinations versus monotherapy, obviously here we have a benefit. Both combinations um, perform better than the single drugs alone uh, against trichoris, and this is based on, on the cure rates. So what alternatives do we have? You see, we cannot even with the drug combinations, we have limitations, so we need to fill uh, the pipeline uh, for Soltans with Hellman's infections. And one drug which uh, is really close to my heart is, is Oxantil Palmoat. It's a, it's a very old drug um, which is used in, in not only in veterinary medicine, but also in, in human medicine in, in some countries, but it was never really approved as a, as a stringent regulatory authority. It's a, it's a very safe drug, it's not absorbed, and um, in our lab models, it performed really very well, much better than the, the standard drugs I have introduced to you. And we have taken, um, this pro these promising lab results a few years ago um, to the field. We have run a lot of studies um, on oxantel, oxantel in combination with albendazole, and, and we've really seen that this is a, a very powerful drug when, when it comes to um, basically to trichoris infections. And this is where, where help came in with regard to oxantel. You heard a lot, uh, many different drugs were researched in our HELP consortium, and oxantel is, is one of them. So our idea of what we would really like to do is to move the forward with oxantel and register it at a stringent regulatory authority. And in the HELP um, project, what we could do is is in one of the work packages, we summarized all the data that was available. and. Unfortunately, also the, when we contact the pharma companies, uh, they couldn't really help us much because the drug is, is very old and they somehow didn't have the information any longer on, on their files. But we collected what, what we could from the literature, um, what, what was unpublished, and we went with these briefing book, we went then to, to Swiss Medic and discussed the drug with them, and what they had suggested was basically that um, a small package is still required for oxantel, which is uh, some preclinical studies as genotox testing, um, an in vivo uh, dose toxicity studies, um, um, including PK, one regulatory phase one study, and one regulatory phase three study. We also, uh, and this is really nice work done by, by my colleagues at DNDI, we, we obviously, when we move forward, we need a, a, a new formulation, we need a new um, drug, because um, the dr Oxantil is available in some of the countries, but it's co-formulated with, with Pyrantel. So, so what we did, or 
DNDI did, they developed really a nice um, new formulation. And you see it's a child-friendly formulation. You can put it on a spoon and it, it develops very quickly in a, in a soft mass. So it's also um, very um, useful at the end if you want to move further, in particular in treating smaller children. Still ongoing are some some final parts of the CMC as a stability study, an analytical method development, and uh, then, of course, packaging uh, for the phase one study. The phase one study will be done um, at Dr. Jongo's site, uh, which he has nicely introduced um, in Bagamoyo. Um, we, we aim to start this spring with Oxand Hill. Uh, we will have three arms. One is a placebo arm with less participants, uh, five participants. We will test one single dose of oxantil palmoet and uh, one multiple dose. We will do um, PK as well to, to really confirm that the drug is not absorbed, um, because if it would be absorbed, um, there would be some more um, in tox studies required. But if you can confirm that it's really not absorbed, um, the way forward for Oxantil will be um, relatively smooth. But we still, um, in the help, we, we can do the phase one study. But for, for moving on further for, with regard to phase three, we need additional funders. And at the end, we, we would need also an, an industrial partner. Last but not least, uh, has been mentioned nicely already by Mark, MODEP side. I, I don't need to, to go into um, detail here. Mark has nicely introduced uh, the molecule and, and the drug. He has also shown that it's really a, a pan nematode drug with, with wide um, activity and several uh, helminths. Uh, you have likely seen that we have published this summer the, the results of our phase 2 eight trial, which I would like to quickly um, introduce in the last minutes of, of my talk. This was a, was a, a, a dose finding phase 2A study done uh, by uh, Emmanuel Mrimi, a former PhD student. We had five milligram amodepside tablets available, so we did a dose finding between five and 30 milligram. We compared it to placebo and an albendazole arm. The results were really um, fantastic. Um, you see that a dose of 15 milligram and above cures all participants. So just to reiterate, this is a single dose. You see cure of trichuris patients compared to, um, uh, as expected, the low efficacy of albendazole and a placebo um, with regard to, to hookworm a bit of a di different shape of the dose response, but also at the higher doses, um, we, we observed a good cure rate um, against hookworm. Ascaris, also all of the doses quite a good cure rate, but we are not really not concerned about Ascaris. We are really most interested in a, a good treatment for, for trichuris. We, we had observed um, adverse events, um, but Reassuringly, most of them were mild. Uh, we had most of them resolved rather quickly. Um, we mainly observed headache and dizziness and some vision blurs, and they were, were dose dependent. So at the, uh, at the highest doses, uh, we, we observed the, the highest, um, or the largest number of adverse events. So what, what we will do next is we have done a, a phase to be um, which was a 30 milligram against hookworm compared to albendazole. Here again, we could confirm the, the good findings, the good results against uh, hookworm observed from the phase 2A, which is really also reassuringly. We, we are starting basically to move into or planning a phase 3 study. Uh, we decided based on the, on the adverse events and, and the activity profile to move forward with a 15 milligram dose, um, which will be then taken into regulatory studies. In 25, we hope to, that these studies will take place and uh, hopefully um, a registration at the FDA in 27 for, for STH. Um, I hope I could have shown you that 
existing until mint digs, and I think we have talked all about this, they have limitations, we need to fill the, the pipeline. I think we have made a step forward in the past decade with uh, bringing new drugs, new combinations, filling this pipeline. We still need to fill it even more, so we are very excited about the, the, the Elanco candidate, which is now moving into preclinical testing, so hopefully this will also move forward. Uh, it's exciting now that we have Oxantil, Palmoet, and Emodepside, which are really now in, in the clinical phases, and hopefully at one point will be, we will be able to treat the, the patients with these two drugs. And uh, on, the, on the other side, we, we need to, to continue our drug discovery efforts. And uh, with this, I, I would like to, to thank um, all my, my partners, my colleagues here, my team in Basel, and uh, my funders, and thank you for the remaining few <laughs> to, to listen to us. <laughs> so now we can open um, the floor if there are questions to, to any of us. Luke. <laughs> I have the speaking pillow now. <laughs> um, sorry, just kidding. Do, do you have any expectation of what the, um, uh, whether Imidep site also affects the prepatent worms? Is it possible that we could get rid of STH with just one round of high coverage PC? It, it was active um, against larvae and adults, so ac across stages and um, I, I haven't mentioned, Emodepside has a, has a very long half-life. So it might be also interesting to really see whether it has like a, a bit of a vaccine-type protective efficacy that you certainly, maybe with, with less frequent rounds, um, you, that you really could decrease the, the burden. I mean, on the other side, when you, when you look, I mean, you, Bruno also has, has worked on PEMBA, there's a, preventive chemotherapy for so many years, but the trichuris prevalence is still above 90%. So we really hope that with, with such a treatment, maybe we could lower the, the burden. Thank you very much. Really wonderful presentation, Jenny. Uh, all these drugs that you're working on are basically repurposed drugs uh, from many veterinary fields. How many efforts are going into discovering really new molecules to try to have a chance, maybe a bit broader uh, spectrum and really, uh, yeah. yeah, looking forward? Um, at the moment, we are very happy that we have the veterinary <laughs> field because otherwise we wouldn't have any antihelmetics. So as you rightly said, uh, we, we can take them over. Um, of course, it also offers um, the huge advantage that uh, we can take it relatively quick into the clinic because it's like drug repurposing. We can save a few steps of, of development. A, a new molecule, which is also somehow related to veterinary medicine, is the Elanco compound that Mark presented. But they are not developing this one. So this would be like a, a brand new molecule just for humans. Um, but we will see how far we can get with it um, because it requires more funds. And maybe just to, to add to that, um, we, we have not talked about this here, but um, uh, th there is attrition rate, especially also for new molecules. So um, we have developed at um, some point um, out of a uh, long Gates activity, which was really a classical screening for compounds in vitro. The resulting compound was a tylosin um, molecule, and that was modified by a pharma company, by AbbVie. And into that went millions of dollars, I think, by that time. Then we moved it with all the knowledge on, of the mode of action, which was via the, the anti wobachia route. This is what, what Mark has presented for the coralliperonin. And, and um, at the end of the day, it, it uh, passed the safety, so it was a wonderful, safe drug that was taken by all the patients, but it uh, failed in the proof of concept. And this is something that... Um, 
no matter if you even have repurposed, if you have a new molecule that we need to account for. And this is very difficult at the moment, I think, or always has been for NTDs, I would say, in this drug discovery space, because right now there's really limited funding. So we're really, really grateful to the European Union to keep the NTDs on the agenda, and hopefully they will do that in the future so that we can maintain this minimal part. Good evening. Um, my name is Bruno Levec from Ghent University. I have two questions. So my first question goes to Mark. And one of your slides, you presented all the different efficacies for the different candidates. And you concluded that you would go forward with candidate five. But if I had a look at all the other Q rates or the efficacy results of the other candidates out of different um, doses, it seems like candidate one is more potent. So I'm, I'm just a bit confused why you went to the uh, for me, at least, not an optimal. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Unfortunately, we had to do this due to the um, talk studies that were performed. So some of the candidates had HERC issues. The other ones did not perform well in the PK essays, and that's why the fifth one was selected. But we could still do more uh, in. Uh, whatever, animal model testings to really see so how good it can improve, uh, perform. So perhaps if we increase the dose, we could also reduce the treatment times. So we have not done a lot of um, yeah, rodent studies yet with this kind of candidate. So it was really a short period of time. We had to yeah, select one in a short period of time. So, yeah. And my second question is, I guess, a more general question. I think, uh, I think it's true. It's amazing what you and your partners have been producing and have been providing the evidence of all these different compounds. M my general question is, okay, once you, what's your thoughts on having these drugs available in terms of who's going to manufacture it and who's going to make them available to the community? Because that's a piece that's still not yet clear for me because it's, it's all good to provide the evidence that we have good drugs, but it would be a pity if we don't have that last mile and to get them to the community. Who's answering? Me? Or? I don't know who wants to, <laughs> to start answering. <laughs> I mean, I can, I can go ahead. I think this is really an... Uh, yeah, a key point and, and we're as a consortium and also as our organizations trying to, 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 to have that in mind from the beginning on and it's again I cannot um, stress enough how important it is to have strong partners on the side and with that I mean pharma partners that in the case of Imodepside it's Bayer it's super important to have that partner for in-kind contribution but also to bring us to the next step. That doesn't mean that we have the full implementation plan ready yet, but uh, that will run further discussions. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I think it's important to think away from MDA um, uh, uh, delivery, but f try to find more sustainable models. For example, you put a dollar on a European drug and you reinvest that into the delivery structures in, in an African country. And we, we will as consortium and also with our partners sit in the future much closer, close, closer together and, and really discuss options and, and try to find ways to establish that. Yeah, yeah, I think also in addition, because the, the setup uh, for this work of course, that's a very, very important question that, okay, you develop a product, how, uh, how about the access to these communities? And in terms of, um, I think there are two issues. There is also regulatory pathways, because, you know, in the future, it's, it's obviously, uh, traditionally, drugs, all kinds of intervention have been tested or assessed or manufactured outside Africa, have been tested outside Africa, have been licensed outside Africa. They just come to Africa for registration and human use. So basically, uh, we, we are trying to change these dynamics because even the regulatory pathways in the future would require you know, some kind of uh, data available coming from the communities. We have been working on other interventions like malaria vaccines. We have evidence over the past five to 10 years that the vaccines that have been working very well for naive population 
are not working very well for pre-exposed population. And you know, if we follow the traditional ways of how the drugs are being licensed and used, uh, it, it will be very challenging for the future. And also, you may, we may, these massive investments can be made for products that are not working. So I think we are in the right path now to, to make sure that we are involving the communities uh, in you know, initial testing, looking at the safety issues, addressing the things like you know, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and uh, quickly go into it at a minimum assessing for efficacy. And then, uh, uh, of course, uh, at the same time, trying to address this question of access to these communities. But I think uh, the, it is important to have uh, significant data related to the future use of these products. And I think what's also important, what you just mentioned, this involvement of the community, and also that point came up at multiple times. Mm -hmm. And this is for a drug developer, super important to know from the beginning on what formulation will you use? What will be really the accepted one? Is it more accepted to have a vaccine or an, an injection shot so that the patient really uh, uh, considers this as the right treatment and being treated? Or will that be an, an easy uh, tablet at the end mm -hmm. of the day? My name is, can you hear me? Okay. My name is Santi Ramon from the University of Zaragoza. I work on the TV field, not on almonds. Uh, but uh, we discovered the activity of the avermectins against mycobacteria. Uh, and when we're looking at the different types of avermectins, uh, we selected selamectin as the potentially best candidate for mycobacterial treatment because uh, Treatment of mycobacteria is different. You need to do is for a long time, uh, several months, repeated dosing. And ivermectin, for example, has neurotoxicity. Also, the, the levels that you achieve in plasma with, uh, with ivermectin are, are very low, are in the nano uh, grams per milliliter range. And the MIC, I guess, tuberculosis or mycobacteria is in the microgram per milliliter range. And selamectin has actually a higher exposure and low and doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. It's actually a veterinary drug used to treat border collies that apparently they are, uh, ivermectin is very toxic for them because they don't have the big glycoprotein. And my question is uh, has selamectin ever been considered uh, or is a need of considering consider another ivermectin for helminth infections because of this? potentially more safe uh, safety properties. Um, so in, in principle, I mean, if we think about ivermectin and moxidectin um, targeting the same molecule, I think because of the lack of investment, it will be very difficult to, to go in a direction like that. The only way forward is really to have something with a completely different mode of action or with a completely uh, uh, expanded uh, activity, meaning across the stages, across the different diseases, so that you really maximize your output out of that. So scientifically, I, I, I would agree with you, and it really, for many of the drugs, the benzimidazoles are the same. It, it really depends on the exposure, what activity you have. But I, I really um, doubt that we can can leverage on, on funding for those kind of directions. Mm. I hope that answers a bit your question. Thank you. <laughs> this is a really crazy little thing. Um, I was really interested to hear uh, the emphasis on the inclusion of women in the phase one, um, because of, of course it's true that primarily women are excluded in phase one trials. So that was very interesting to see. And I just wondered what the overall strategy is behind that, and if you have sort of thoughts about go, no, go decisions down the road related to safety and the inclusion of women? Yeah, so, so basically the, the, 
you know, they, they basically, they, for example, in case of children, we always say, you know, children uh, are not like small adults. So basically, they, they have their characteristics, their responses, and everything else. And also, traditionally, we, have, we did like previous trials five to seven years ago. Phase one, most cases, uh, we were only including young males, volunteers. And um, from regulatory perspective, there have been challenges, for example, in defining the requirements for, for you know, what, what would take for a woman to be involved. And in most cases, it would look at the risk of the product. So basically, whether the product has teratogenic effect or embryo toxicity effect, or even a spermatogenicity effect. So basically, if there's spermatotoxicity, even for male volunteers, we'll need to have some intervention, use of condoms and everything for phase one trials. And uh, in currently, most of the guidelines, uh, the guidelines are available on what woman needs to be uh, taking in terms of risk of the product, uh, whether double barrier or whether highly effective hormonal or any other intervention. The other problem also was on the community perspective, because even if you go there and you tell people you need to use this in order to be involved in the clinical trial, if, you are, if this is like the primary announcement that you are making as a requirement, it will be very difficult. That's what we have experienced in the past. What, what has contributed to the, to the participation is, the, is that the, the family planning methods and everything and training are already ongoing in these communities. So most of the young uh, female uh, uh, individuals are already on the, on the uh, family planning methods and therefore uh, uh, involve, getting them involved in the trial with the requirement of using highly effective methods of pregnancy prevention has become, I think, more convenient. And in some cases, we are even seeing more uh, female being involved uh, because now they don't see this as a strange requirement because in the past, this was a strange requirement that why should I do all this in order to be involved in the clinical trial? But this is something that when you tell them you need to be on hormonal contraceptive, and they say, I'm already second year now. So it has made it uh, a bit, uh, I think, easier. And also we have one thing that we did not um, uh, show here is the massive community engagement. We have the community advisory boards, basically, that are going to these communities that we are doing the trials. We are, we are making sure that people understand the concepts of the clinical trials. We have, arguably, some people don't really trust, but we are using the protocol understanding checklists to qualify participants for involvement in the clinical trials. So there are several uh, eff uh, efforts that are being made from the community perspective, uh, uh, until the participants agree to be in the clinical trials, uh, uh, this help also not only for enrollment, but also for retention. Because in the end, you want to have someone who has volunteered to participate in the trial also stay until the end of the study. And we are providing that kind of support to make sure that that, that is the case. Shall we close? Thank you very much for sticking in so late um, with us in this big room. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for...